Mungo Castle, and which was a British troop ship. And we knew we were someplace. We didn't know where. We knew we were going someplace. And by this time, we had our tropical gear, of course. And uh, it was finally when we're outside the Mediterranean somewhere where they told us where we were going to go, to Sicily. During the voyage from Gibraltar to uh, Sicily, we were attacked by, I think it was a uh, six subs, if I remember correctly. Our supply ship was hit with all our supplies for tro tropical dress and all the rest of it, plus our medical supplies. These little corvettes got in the circle in this one area and they were throwing depth charges, eh? And uh, in this one area, all at once, this thing like a cigar come out of the water, way up, and then down a little. And I was standing on the bow there watching, and uh, it blew, and it was on fire, and it went down, it was gone. It was a submarine, German submarine they got. At the time we went in there, that was the largest invasion force that had ever been amassed in history. I think there was something over 3,000 ships. The Mediterranean was so rough that it smashed the landing craft, so we were delayed for a day. So on the 10th, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they lowered another landing craft. Going down, there was bloody uh, scrambling nets, and the old ships would go like this, and she'd bang, and you'd hope to God when you get down the bottom that you, you were going to hit that landing craft. And we had all our fighting equipment on, weighing perhaps uh, 70 or 80 pounds. And when we ran off that uh, platform, we ran into 10 feet of water. Your main thought is to get to shore as fast as you can. Because like I say, in the water, you have no protection whatsoever. And at least when you get to shore, you have some cover. My first task was to blow up the barbed wire that was along the shoreline. And we did that at what we called a Bangalore torpedo with an eight-foot piece of pipe packed with explosives. And you just pushed it under the wire and light your match to it and it'd blow up. We were to shoot anything, any person we saw walking. And about four o'clock in the morning, the first people we saw walking down the, down the beach were three nuns. Nobody fired a shot, thank goodness. We had a couple of mixer oh, smiths, just whatever they were strapped us a couple of times, but there wasn't much aircraft. So. Still, it, it hadn't got to the point of being real frightened yet, you know, there wasn't enough. It was almost like a maneuver. And the dust was about six inches deep and hot. My God, you couldn't hardly breathe. Just like flour. The guy ahead of you, he, he would got a hundred pounds of flour through over time. There was so much dust in that. It was fun and games. That was one of the rules that Colonel Booth said, we had to keep our equipment clean. And you can't, there's no such thing as keeping equipment clean in these kind of dust storms you get there. We got sunburned through our shirts. And the medical officer made a concoction of iodine and uh, olive oil. And he used that for a suntan lotion, and it worked. In Espica, that was the second town in. Uh, we sent, I think it was seven guys on a patrol into this town, and they fired a couple of shots, and I think, I believe it was 2,700 Italians still, you know, they were ready to quit before we even got there, so. Uh, it seemed like we were going to have a pretty easy time. We hadn't gone very far when I saw a lot of black dots in front of us and on the side of it in the field on the right. And I looked at them through my binoculars and they were carriers. And as we got closer, I realized they, it was the entire Hampshire Regiment's carrier platoon. Every one of them knocked out and the crew's bodies still in them. And I looked up on the hill and I could see this German mortar firing. It just seemed 40 of them were in the air and come down and it blanketed our run gun carrier our crew, because they were right out in the open. They were blown apart, on fire. So I had an extra package, I gave it to him. I just turned and stepped away, and he was cut right off here. 
I heard him make a noise. I turned and looked. I had a hard time keep my dinner down. And he handed me the bag of cigarettes that the guy gave, gave him. He said, here, I won't need these now. You know, our nurses and doctors, they, they my God, they worked hard because they were a lot of wounded in there. Too many of us were sick. Because malaria, jaundice, or dysentery. And it was the medical officers who were good scroungers, and they got a um, cache of um, German supplies. They found them that the Germans had left. So that's what we started with when, uh, when we first started. The, they would pick, take a position, and they would stop you right there. They had, you know, they had uh, uh, 88s. They just they, when those things went off, and mortars, the whole work. And you can always tell when they were leaving because they throw everything, put the kitchen sink in. They'd sell for about five or ten minutes, maybe a half an hour break, and then they'd sell again. So all together we had 12 men killed and 23 wounded. Almost every real strategic tough target was given to Canadians. At Ajira, the Germans had blown the bridges and the railroad bridge was still up. The colonel decided that we'd take the tanks across the bridge, the railroad bridge, into the valley, which surprised the Germans. They didn't expect us to be there. So we uh, went up and that's where we took Adreno. Our policy was to chase the Germans tanks and when they we got close enough we found we couldn't hit them because our shells would not long, uh, wouldn't fire them long enough and the Germans could with their 88s. So we used to turn around and hightail it out of there. But what we did was turn our turret around. The Germans couldn't do that. They were on an angle like this. The 88s only could go from there to there. They couldn't understand this here. We're running away and we're hitting them and knocking tanks out. And the Germans waited until we got almost into Glamishelli. They knocked out the first and the last tank. And that meant we couldn't move then because the roads were too narrow. We couldn't turn them around. So. And because we are so well trained, we automatically just uh, dived off the tanks and charged right away. And it was only about 150 yards we were in on the Germans before they could reload and took the town. If we caught anyone, I'd haul her out to. And a uh, German, like, I said, German soldier, come on in, with your hands up, we'll take you as a prisoner of war. And mostly, they did. How we ever did, I don't know. You could see miles around, just as clear as a bell. The Germans standing up there, seeing every little movement that we made. And we went up to uh, and sort of probed our way into a Palermo, and that was the end of it as far as Sicily was concerned. And then it was a little hiatus until they started the invasion of uh, Italy. <laughs> 